Um, uh, like Pastor Aaron said, man, uh, my name is Mike, and for some of you guys do know me. Um, for some of you guys who don't, uh, this place to me is holy ground. And I don't give a lot of places that title in my life. I'm not going to cry. Stop. Um, uh, but it was right here. It was right here when uh, I walked into these doors as a 14-year-old chubby kid with no game. Uh, and I gave my life to Christ for the very first time. It was right here where this foot pedal sits. Um, I told you I'm not going to cry. Stop. And so uh, I, uh, I just want to say, Aaron, and thank you to you and your family. Thank you for having me, man. It is an honor to be here. Um, I'm very, I get to share the stage with giants, man. I get to stand on the shoulders of giants. So uh, for those of you guys who are uh, maybe new here, this is your very first time. Um, this, what, what happens in this church is not normal. It should be, but it's not normal. This is a very special place, and I'm very grateful and honored to be here. So thank you so much for having me here. I'm very honored and blessed to be here. Um, but like I said, came into this place when I was 14, chubby and no game. I am now 32 years old. I'm like the weird cousin you've never met and now we're meeting. I'm 32 years old, a little less chubby and lots of game. So I'm going to show you a picture of my family to prove my point. I think we might have a picture of my family, maybe. There they are. So that is my beautiful wife, Tiffany. We will be married 11 years in November. Uh, that is my, I know, right? Holla. Uh, that is my daughter, Isla. She, don't let the smile fool you. She will judo chop your neck if you give her the chance. Uh, but she just turned eight, and that is my brute of a son named Banner. Yes, like Bruce Banner. We named him after the Hulk, and he is always angry. Uh, and uh, he just turned five. So that is my family. Unfortunately, they could not be here today because they're holding it down back home. Um, but they are very, very grateful that you allowed me to be here. So uh, I want to get into this. I really believe, guys, I have went through so much prayer for this um, because I really wanted God to speak, and I really wanted God to show up, and I don't want it to be me. I want it to be all his words. So before we get into the message, I'm going to pray. Will you guys just pray with me? Okay. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. I thank you. So I am so humbled and honored to be here, Lord, to be with your people, to share the word that I believe you have given me to share. So God, I just pray for open hearts. God, I pray for open hearts and open minds um, to receive what you have to say. God, not my words, your words. So if there's anything inside of me, Lord Jesus, that shouldn't be shared, then silence me, God. But I pray right now that it would just be fertile soil that your word goes out into and gets planted, God, to bring forth fruit, Lord. We love you so much, Jesus. We give you all the glory for what you did for us. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. And the church said, amen. amen. Okay, so we are going to be in Second Chronicles chapter 20. Starting in verse 5, and I know what you're thinking. Yes, millennials still read the Old Testament and still find it relevant, okay? So we're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 5. But before we do that, I need to give you context of what I'm speaking about today. So I'm going to be real short in this backstory. I'm going to talk about a man named Jehoshaphat. Okay, apparently his parents didn't like him very much because they named him Jehoshaphat. All right, so but Jehoshaphat is very important, and why is because he is the king of Judah. And in this context, and what we're talking about, the king of Judah right now is trying to bring Israel and Judah, Jerusalem and Judah, the nation of Israel together under the banner of God. He's trying to establish some order, he's trying to put some judges into place to make this chaos controlled. And there's a lot of people who are taking notice of what God is trying to do through this man, and they don't like it. How many of you guys know the moment you try to take a step and follow in God, sometimes the enemy rises up and doesn't like it? So here we have three different armies that are coming against Jehoshaphat, and they are declaring war against them. We have the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Meunites. Again, awful names, okay? But we have three different armies, three different kings, three different nations coming against Jehoshaphat. They have now declared war on this man of God, and it actually says in Scripture that he got scared. Because sometimes when things hit the fan, it gets a little scary sometimes. So we're going to be in Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 5 through 12, and this is what it says. Don't worry if you don't have a Bible. I'm sure there's going to be some, some words up on the screen. It says, it says, Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. He prayed, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are the ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. Oh, our God, did you not drive out those who live in this land when your people Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here. 
Built this temple to honor your name, they said. Whenever we are faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, or famine, we can come and stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. Thank God for his promises like that in Scripture. That we can come before the temple where his name is honored. This place was built to honor his name. And it says that we can come before him. We can cry out to him. We can give him our situation, and he will hear us and rescue us. And it says this, it says, and now you see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. So they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us. For they have come to throw us out of your land, which you give us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. When I was praying, guys, I was praying, I was fasting, I, was, did, I did everything a good little AG boy knew how to do to prepare for this message. And when I was asking the Lord, I said, God, what do you want to say? This phrase stuck out to me. I do not know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. I don't know about you, but I have been there so many times where I've been standing before God and was like, God, I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. Now, I don't want to be the preacher that gives 2020 any more power than it already has taken from us. But here's the thing. There's very real residual effects from that year that people even right now are still going through. Your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, your family. We have lost loved ones. We've lost jobs because of stuff that went on in that year. There's been moments where people have said, God, I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. Just to give you guys some history about me and my family, uh, me and my wife got married when we were uh, 21. We were, we were pretty young when we got married. Um, and I had just graduated the third year of a discipleship program. I was a certified pastor of the Assemblies of God. I was ready to go out and do the work. I was like, man, let's go. Jesus, you did the work for three years. I went to school for three years. Like, you fulfilled your promise. Well, I'm going to fulfill my promise now. Like, it's going to be great. And then I got married. And then God said, no, you need to take some time. And you just need to be you and work on your marriage and, and build your relationship up with your wife. I said, oh, okay. I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. Like, you got me, right? And so for, I worked at Starbucks. She worked at David's Bridal. We just did our things for a little while. And then I remember it was about eight months into our marriage. We were approached by Tiffany's cousin who had planted a church in northern Wisconsin. And he asked us if we would pray about coming and being part of the team. And I was like, no, I'm not going. It's northern Wisconsin, Packer country. I'm not going. <laughs> I'm not going. And so through a lot of my own insecurity and pride because here's the thing, when I would go there, if I chose to go there, no position awaited me, but the position was for my wife. And so I was like, okay, God, and, and he hit me with this truth. He goes, okay, listen, son, you want to know how to serve your bride? What did I do to my bride? I died for her. You die to yourself and you go. Okay. Right? So I went, we stayed there for three and a half years. God, I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. And in those three and a half years, at one point, our daughter was six months old. Uh, my wife was full-time kids pastor, which meant I was full-time kids pastor because you just inherit what your wife would be doing. And so, uh, guys, there are so many incriminating videos of me as different characters, okay, just floating around in the ether of the internet. At one point, I had to become a character named Pruka von Schmidt, and that's exactly how I talked for the whole kids series, okay? Um, don't look it up. I promise you it's not worth it. Um, but so at one point, my daughter's six months old. My wife is full-time kids pastor, so I'm involved in the kids ministry. Also, I'm full-time youth pastor for that year, unpaid, full-time every single Wednesday, coming up with stuff for the youth to do. And then on top of that, I was working 40-plus hours a week at a factory in town just to make a living for the family. And on top of all that, every single Sunday, me and my wife would split. She would take the kids, and I would go to a church 30 minutes away and preach for them because they had no pastor to fill the pulpit. God, I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. And after, a lot, and after that season was up, I, I talked to our pastor in the church that I was preaching at, actually wanted me to, and my wife to take over as lead pastors. I was 24 at the time. And this was a 100-year-old Presbyterian church <laughs> in Crivets, Wisconsin. Crivets, okay? You don't really want to pastor in Crivets, but God told me go to Crivets, okay? And so here I am, 24 years old, Hispanic, 
tatted up, and I'm in an all-white community in Krivitz, Wisconsin. One of these doesn't look like the other, okay? Like, it was awkward. It was so awkward. But God moved, and it was crazy, and God did amazing things. Guys, when I started there, we had 25 people. When I ended there, we almost had 140. God was moving, and people would ask me, what are you doing? I said, praying a lot, bro. Praying a lot. You don't even understand. But time went on, and I, I really, they were, they were kind of holding uh, really, really true to, to who the God had created the church to be and really felt passionate about. So I said, okay, well, then you need a pastor in here that can honor what you guys believe in all this stuff, and so let me help you. So I actually was on the committee. They put me on the committee to find another pastor to come in. So I stayed until we found one. He is there to this day, and me and him, me and him have an amazing relationship. It's, it's beautiful. They're healthy. It's awesome. But in that, uh, we felt transition, obviously, had no job. So what, then you're in transition. So then God called me back to the mega church in Illinois where I did my schooling to, and I was there for two years as spiritual discipleship and travel director at, the, at this big mega church there. God, I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. You need to help me. You need to show me. And in the middle of that time, we had our son, Banner. My wife uh, suffered with postpartum depression, and things just got real. So I had to take a step back. I left that ministry position because my family is, first and foremost, my main ministry. So I left that position, and we worked at Starbucks, opposite shifts, back at it, making lattes for stuck-up people. It was awesome. <laughs> it was great. Loved it. Pretty good at it, actually. But we, we were working opposite shifts, so I, I, I would go, and for an entire year, we worked there, and I would work the open shift, which if you know what time Starbucks opens, they open at 4.30. So if you work there and you work the open shift, you have to show up at least by 4 a.m. on God. Jesus isn't even up at that time, okay? <laughs> Ungodly time. So I would work 4 a.m. I'd get home at 1. My wife, we would tag up, and she would leave, and she'd go to work. And so then that was how we lived life for an entire year. Ships passing in the night, things. We would make it work as, as best we could. But God, I don't know what to do. You called me in the full-time ministry. Like, yeah, you've commissioned me. You've anointed me. What am I doing working at Starbucks making lattes for Susie? I don't get it, God. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you for help. And then about a year in, I felt like God called me to do the most crazy thing I had ever felt like he had called me to do. He asked me and my wife to move our entire family of four within two months to Southern California to help with the church plant again. We have had, knew no one except the pastor and his wife. We have no family, no friends out there, but God asked us to go, so you just go. Side note, it's going to turn out really well for you if you just do what God has asked me to do. So we went, and it was, it was cool because we had housing lined up, we had jobs lined up, and so we get there, and all this is two days after my wife gets there because I get there first, set everything up. Two days after we get there, housing falls through, jobs falls through. Y'all ever been to Southern California? It's expensive, Okay. So here's my family of four. At the time, I'm 29 years old. I'm a man, 29 years old. Why are you laughing? That's messed up. But I'm, but I'm 29 years old, and, and me and my wife and my two kids live in one room of a house for an entire year in Southern California where it is too hot to run the air, con or too expensive to run the air conditioner. We were hotboxing each other all the time in that room. And I just remember, God, what are you doing? What am I supposed to do? God, I'm a man. I'm supposed to provide for my family, and I can't even give us our own space. Guys, we lived in Southern California with our pastor. So it was me, my wife, our two kids, him, his wife, and their two kids. We all lived together for three years. Because when God asks you to do something, you just do it, even though you may not understand or have clarity to what is going to happen. And it was year two that I really felt like God was leading me and my family in, into something new. I thought he was going to ask us to stay. They're like, man, you move a lot. I do move a lot, and it's not my fault, okay? <laughs> but I remember God was like, I want you to take every single experience you've ever had in Rockford, Illinois, northern Wisconsin, southern California, Indiana. I want you to take all of that experience working with all kinds of economic uh, uh, and, and racial divides. I want you to take all that experience, and guess what, Mike? I want you to move you, your wife, and your two beautiful kids to the most statistically the most segregated economically and racial city that we have in America, downtown Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I want you to start a church, and I want you to go tell people about me. I told you I'm not going to cry, so I'm not. Stop looking at me. Um, and so that's what we did. With the blessing of our pastor, they launched us out like crazy, and it was amazing. I love them. And we're, they're on our board, and all this stuff is great. So we moved to downtown Milwaukee, Wisconsin to start a church. 
I don't know what to do, God. But I'm looking to you for help. So we have these mom- this moment where these nations, three kings, three different nations, three different armies declare war on Jehoshaphat. And it's crazy because when this happens, Jehoshaphat has one thing he does. He gathers up everybody. He gets the kids, the wives, the, the neighbors that annoy you, your coworkers that you're frustrated with. He gets everybody together and goes, listen, we need to pray, we need to fast, and we need to seek God together because it's about to go down. We need some help. So everyone gets, and here's the jacked up thing. God doesn't even give Jehoshaphat the message. Have you guys ever been praying for something and all of a sudden someone else gets the word that you were looking for? It's frustrating, isn't it? So all of a sudden, here comes now this guy who has the message. His name is Jaheel, but I'm going to call him Bob because I hate saying Jaheel. So Bob comes and the man with the plan, he says, hey, look, I got it. Don't worry. I know what God's saying. He's saying, don't be discouraged and don't be afraid of this mighty army. Oh. Oh, so you're admitting that they're also a mighty army. Sick, man. Sometimes Christians give the worst advice. I see you're going through it, brother, and I see it, and if I see it, God sees you're going through it. Really, bro? Because I feel like God needs bifocals because it's real in these streets, and I'm hurting. Does he actually see me? And so Jehoshaphat gets this message from Bob, and he says, yo, don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. Listen, God's got you. And this is actually what it says in 2 Chronicles 20, uh, 16 through 17. This is what Bob says. He says, tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens up in the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, pull out your swords, ready up your shields, get your your, your arrows and your quivers, get all that stuff. Uh, Take your positions, get ready to fight like you've never fought before. Wait. That's not what that says. It says, take your positions and then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He's with you. O people of Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow for the Lord is with you. So let me get this straight, Bob. Army's coming from this side, from this side, from this side. We have three armies that are coming against us and not just me, man, like all of my people, my, the, the cousins and the uncles and the brothers and the sisters and the mothers and the children, like all these armies are coming with me and you just want us to stand still and watch. See, sometimes, sometimes we get the answer, but it's just not the one we want. Sometimes, God, you're praying so much. You're asking God so much, especially within these last few months. You're asking so much. God, I need an answer. I need an answer. I need an answer. And here's the thing. God's probably already given you the answer. It may not be the answer you want, and it also may not be from who you want it to be from. So I have a question for you. What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you don't know what to do? Do you face your situation and your problem in your own strength and in your own might, or do you actually let God resolve it for you and believe that he's good for it? We talk a big, if we're really honest, we talk a really big game in church about trusting and having faith in God, but when stuff hits the fan, so many times we're wanting to take up our own shield and our own strength and our own sword, and we want to go to war. Because it's easy to move in action, it's really hard to just stand still. Why do you think scripture says that sometimes he forces you to lie down in green pastures? Because we don't want to. We're stubborn that way. What's crazy is I did a little research. A few chapters prior in Chronicles 7, uh, 17, chapter 17, it actually gives you a numerical count of the army Jehoshaphat had in his back pocket. See, so when you read this passage, you're like, I'm, I'm sure he was scared. I, does he even have an army? Oh, he did. And it was actually a really big army. Matter of fact, if you actually do the math, it says that his army was roughly 1,160,000 people deep. 1,160,000 people deep. To put that in perspective, as of 2020, the numbers for our U.S. Army, now this is including the the regular army, the Army National Guard, and the Army Reserve. As of 2020, they only had 1,500,000. So he had 150, roughly 155,000 more people in his army than we have in our current army. What's crazy is in scripture, God did a lot more with a lot less. Remember Gideon? 300,000 people? 300? This is Jerusalem? Like, that's how it should have gone down, you know what I mean? 
But God's done a lot more with a lot less. So what did Jehoshaphat do? He could have marched out with his own army and been like, yo, I got the numbers. We, it ain't nothing. Let's see what we got. And, and according to scripture, these were mighty men trained in war. Like these were bad men. Spec ops kind of guys. But this is what Jehoshaphat did. He says, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 18, it says this. It says, then King Jehoshaphat rallied the troops, gave a really great speech, and then kept on marching. No, that's not what it says. It says, then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. So what did Jehoshaphat do when he didn't know what to do? What should we do when we don't know what to do? My first point is this. So in the middle of his worry, Jehoshaphat took a posture of worship. So here's your first, your first thing. When you're in the middle of you don't know what to do, in the middle of your worry, take a posture of worship. I, I've been told all the time, man, in speaking classes, they have those preaching classes, they have those. And they're like, when you preach, give a tangible thing, something that people can physically do so that it's easy for them. Okay, I don't know how much more tangible you want to get when it says take a posture of worship. So when he says that they worship the Lord, this is what the word actually means according to the original language. It means to bow self down, to crouch, fall down flat, humbly beseech, do in reverence and worship. It's a physical act. We want a tangible thing. I don't know how much more tangible it gets than to do this. You heard my knees cracking, I'm old. This is what it means to worship in the middle of your worry. Not to face it in your own strength, but to actually get on your knees and physically posture yourself to declare that he is always greater than you. If we really do buy into this thing that he's the king of the universe, if we really do buy in that he's God who holds the world in his hand, then we should physically posture ourselves sometimes in worship. It goes on to say this in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20 through 21. It says this. It says, early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his splendor. This is, what this, this is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. So on the way to battle, he told them to believe. On the way to battle, he told them to believe. Now, this word believe is really interesting to me because it's actually broken down into two different words in the original meaning. The first one is yah men, and the second one, or the, uh, yah mean, and the second word is amen. The first word, y'all mean, means, uh, in the original language, it means right hand. Well, that's interesting. Right hand, okay? Well, what's the second part mean? The second part means to support or have faith in. To support or have faith. Well, what's interesting about the right hand is, the right hand, historically, has always been the hand of action. So soldiers, when they would march out, and they would have their shield in their left hand or their left arm, and they would always carry their sword in their right hand. Because the right hand is always the hand of action. Where's Jesus sitting right now? At the right hand of the Father, waiting to come back. So what Jehoshaphat is telling his people is after we get done posturing ourselves in a physical act of worship, now what our chance to do is we have to act in faith. Act in faith. So here's the second thing if you're taking notes. In the midst of fear, act in faith. When you don't know what to do, in the midst of fear, act in faith. This is the spiritual act. We already covered the physical. So now this is the spiritual. We are both physical and spiritual beings. Some of you may be like, oh, Mike, it's not that easy to have faith, man. It's not, I'm not a faith person. I really don't have that much faith. Like, I don't have as much faith as the person next to me. I'm going to discredit all of that right now. I'm going to prove with a very simple uh, analogy that every single person in this room has the exact same amount of faith as every other person in this room. You ready? You ready? You sure? There's no going back. You're held accountable to what you know. No going back. You ready? Okay. I was paying attention. Not one person, when you walked in to sit down, checked the welds on your chair to see if it would hold your weight. <laughs> Not one person. You just sat down. 
Because why? You trusted in your truster that the weight was gonna that the weight was gonna be held by the chair. You had what? Faith. You didn't think about it. You just sat down. And some of you are more willing to put your faith in a chair than your faith in God. I know this stuff hurts, but here's the thing. The only reason I'm standing up here with this microphone is because God preached it to me first. None of you got down and was like, I wonder if these welds will hold. (laughs) None of you did it. You just had faith. So here's the thing. It's not about if you have faith. You all have faith. It's not even about how much faith you have because all of you have the exact same amount of faith as everyone else. It's about what you're putting your faith in. Some of you are putting your faith, can we just be real, man, this, this last year, was, it revealed a lot. I think that's a really good thing. It revealed a lot about our hearts, our intentions, our motives, our faith systems, our belief systems, the structures in which we cling to things. Man, we put our rest and our, and our ease and our peace in the hands of a political party. Can I just, Jesus was Middle Eastern. He doesn't have one. I know that may be really offensive to some people in here, and I'm sorry, but Jesus was born in Nazareth, not in America. What are you putting your faith in? The reason why you, I'm going to read this because I need, I feel like this was something that the Lord, the reason why you might be so overwhelmed right now with what you're facing is because there is nothing physically you can do about it. You might be trying so hard to correct and to fix something that God wants to show you he's going to take it from you. He wants to fight for you. But do you actually have faith that he values you that much? What's crazy is, and I fall subject to this too, guys, I will preach someone's ear off about how much God loves them, but I will go into my own prayer closet doubting the same thing for myself. You guys need to believe and have faith that God actually sees you, knows you by name, and knows how many hairs are on your head. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 22 through 24 says this. And I'm going to wrap up. So if the worship team can come up and make me sound more spiritual, that'd be great. <laughs> Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 22 through 24 says like this. It says, at the very moment they began to sing and give praise. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting amongst themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. So the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the woods, and all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemies had escaped. So here they are thinking that, okay, we're going we're gonna to go out, put this in context, we're going to go out, we're going to expose ourselves, we're going to give away our tactical advantage, they're going to see exactly where we are because we're cresting the hill, and then we're actually just going to stand there, and hopefully we see, we see what God is going to do. Hopefully he shows up, and hopefully he does something amazing, and by the time they got there, he had already done it. But you know what's crazy about that? It says... At the very moment, at the very moment, they began to sing and give praise. God already did it. Before they even got to the hill, he already did it. So not only did God take care of it, but he did it in a way that exceeded their expectation. And this is not a sugar stick message of like, oh, if you just do this, then God will do this. No, sometimes you still have to march out against the army. And there's still an army facing you down. So it's not the fact that the army went away. The threat was very real. But God's solution was even better than that army. And if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he did it for them, he's going to do it for you. Can you imagine how much tangible faith it took for for my man Jeho over here to actually take all of Judah and Jerusalem to march out and just expose every single person he loved and cared for? Think about it. It's not easy. So I'm not negating about what you're going through in the battle you're about to go and march head on into and just, just stand there. I know it's going to be real for you. But can you place your faith instead of in a chair in God Almighty himself? 
and what Jesus Christ already did for you, claiming you, saying you're his, because he already paid the price. It's done. So for, for how it looked for me, when we were leaving California, we had three months from the time that we announced we were going to do this church thing, and, and we needed to fundraise in those three months so that me and my wife could do this full time for this first year so that we could do things like this and, and pour back out into our city before we even started a service. We had to fundraise. We had to fundraise $94,000 in three months in the dead center of COVID. Sure, I'll stand there. It wasn't easy. Might have well been a million. What's, what's even nuts, man, is giving in that season for churches had gone down 70% across the board. You want me to do what, God? Raise what? And how long? Sick. Awesome. Never raised a dime in my life. Perfect. Two weeks before we left California, we had $105,000 in the bank. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crest the hill, and hopefully, God, you show up. Oh, Mike, don't worry. Son, don't worry, because two weeks before you even get to that point, I'm going to have it taken care of. But it was scary, y'all. Second Chronicles 20, I promise you I'm landing this plane. Second Chronicles 20, verse 29 through 30 says this. When all the surrounding kingdoms heard that the Lord himself had fought against the enemies of Israel, just takes one time. Just takes one time. The fear of God came over them. So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace for God had given him rest on every side. Jehoshaphat goes into battle with three armies heading his way. When God was, when it was all said and done, God had his way, he had peace on every side of him. He went from having war on every side to having peace on every side. Faith is not a practical thing for a human standpoint. It's not. It's not. God's going to ask you to do some things that kind of take you out of your comfort zone, that, but that's the indication that you know you're doing it right. But I don't know about you guys, but I'm so sick of living a natural life. I'm so sick of being able to put things into my own credit. Guys, I want to live a supernatural life. I, what that means is it's going to supersede your own effort, your own expectation, and your own precepts and concepts. We are not smart enough to outthink God and what he wants to do in your life, every single person here, you couldn't even dream it yet. But having faith to stand there and let God do his thing, it's gonna take some work. I really believe that when God gave me this message that he wanted to start to call people to drop their swords, drop their shield, drop fighting in their own strength and give it to him to worship him, actually invite him into the moment and let him show you how much he loves you. Let him show you that your efforts, your 1,160,000 person army that you have in your back pocket, your, your credibility, your education, your fortitude, your sheer willpower, it's nothing compared to his plan and what he wants to do for your life. All you gotta do Stand.